and we'll introduce our speaker today is Jim Hislop. He mm -hmm. born and bred and educated in Cape Town, passionate about old Cape buildings and historical research. He's a, a founder member of the Facebook group, the Cape Town Threatened Buildings. Well, and he published a lovely book in uh, wheat fields and windmills earlier and thinking of republishing <laughs> if there's a demand. He has written, just written Behind the Castle and he's going to speak to us on Behind the Castle District 6. I would like to say uh, his book is available. Um, we can give you details later. And um, I'm going to hand you over to Jim and ask all the viewers if you would kindly just mute your phones and that while Jim speaks. Thank you. Jim, over to you. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, and thanks for having me. And uh, thanks for attending. I appreciate it. And yeah, thanks for the invite. It's really, uh, like I say, this is the first time I've done this via uh, Zoom, so it's a new experience for me, uh, but something I really need to get to grips with because um, I think this is the way it's going to go from now on, so for the foreseeable future anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, this is my second book that I'm going to be talking about today. You can see it on your screen as well, uh, Behind the Castle. Um, like the first book, it took me about four years to put together, um, just because I was doing it in my spare time. It's really a labor of love doing these sort of books because um, it just takes so long. Uh, you have to put a roof over your head while you're doing it and earn money. And then you have to uh, put time aside to do it. And it takes, it is very time consuming. Um, I also do all the, the layout and the design myself. Um, which I love doing, uh, but it just makes the whole process uh, quite, quite long-winded. Um, but as I said, I really love doing it. So, so thanks for watching and let's get on to it. Um, so as you can see on, on your screen, you can see the cover of the book. Um, you might ask why behind the castle I just thought it was a great title because um, if you look at the old Cape Almanacs and street directories, um, early 19th century ones, um, you'll see there was an area listed um, in the, in the um, sort of suburbs of Cape Town and they just said they called it behind the castle. And that was the area loosely referred to, uh, that loosely referred to what became District 6. Um, it was just really a cluster of farms at that, at that point. And that's my main interest is, is really looking at the early estates of, of early suburbs of Cape Town. Um, and that's really how District 6 uh, started as a built environment. It was a cluster of, of uh, farming estates or market gardens, uh, small farms that created, um, uh, produced produce, uh, fruit and vegetables and meat and grain uh, for the growing uh, settlement of Cape Town, as well as passing ships um, going to the, the colonies. So, um, yeah, I just find them fascinating because they were um, beautiful homesteads, first of all, and they also, um, I love the architecture and just the rustic, um, the, the vernacular architecture I find uh, is always interested me more than sort of uh, architect design architecture. Yeah. Um, so everybody knows about District 6, but I'm just going to give you some um, basic, the basic rundown just to refresh your memory. So here we have a picture of it in its later days. District 6 was a vibrant, heavily populated mixed race neighborhood that stood below the base of Devil's Peak, Table Mountain, on the eastern outskirts of Cape Town CBD. It was declared a white group area in 1966 by the apartheid government. 
And um, between 1966 and the early 80s, 60,000 people were forcibly removed to the Cape Flats and other areas, and their homes, streets, and shops were demolished. Um, however, some of the churches and mosques remained, and you'll see some, a few houses did actually remain, which I've, some of them I've included in the book. Um, and today, only parts of the former District 6 have been redeveloped, as you know, and the rest lies vacant uh, some, you know, up to 50 years later. Okay. Um, so looking, this is one of the earliest maps that shows the area in any sort of detail. Um, the elements map, um, it's just a portion of it uh, from 1818. Um, on the if you can see my mouse, um, on the far top left, you'll see the castle and um, hence the sort of area behind it here called, you know, that, that they refer to as behind the castle. Um, you can see why, because there's the castle, everything was sort of, all these little farms were behind it um, on the mountainside and table bays on your top left. And then you can see these little bits of um, land sort of sprawling out behind the castle. And these were, these, these were the little market garden or farming estates that were producing as fruit and vegetables and meat and also wine. Um, so I've labeled some of them on, on the map, um, some of the major ones. And these, these all have chapters of, dedicated to them in the book. Um, Zonnebloem on your far right was the first one. Um, its origins date back to the early 18th century. So about 1700, 1705, around about there. Um, and it grew and grew into, in, to become quite a large estate, taking up most of what became District 6. Um, but then there were also some smaller estates uh, closer to the castle, such as Velkom, uh, Hanover House, Rumorf, Varkas List, and Hope Lodge. And those had all appeared by the early 19th century. Okay, now we're looking at the same area, a little bit zoomed in, but uh, I zoomed in a little bit so you can actually see the sort of street layouts. Um, and this is sort of the 1950s, um, late 50s, I think. Um, and you can see how heavily built up District 6 became. Uh, right at the top, you've got the castle on the top left, just the edge of it. And then I've marked some of the roads, the major thoroughfares, uh, Solari Road, Hanover Street, the famous Hanover Street, and Constitution Street. And it just shows how very built up it became um, in, its, in its later years from those early farming estates. So this book is really the story of what happened in between that, that time, but mainly in the earlier, earlier days. Okay, um, so Zonneblum that I mentioned um, was a large estate and at its sort of peak, it was owned by um, Alexander Tennant, the merchant, colonist and slave trader, businessman. Um, <clears throat> you'll see a picture of him on the bottom right. Um, and he, he um, was quite wealthy at the time and uh, kept, apparently kept slaves on the estate before they were, were transported elsewhere. And he would also um, import them to, to the actual Cape. Um, and you can see, um, the, can everybody see my mouse? Can you see it moving? Yes, we can. Yeah. Um, so on the far right that I'm circling, that's actually the homestead of, of um, Zonneblum. And then to the left, all the way, going all the way to the left, these are the outbuildings. Um, so looking at this picture, you wouldn't really think this was early District 6. You'd think this is Stellenbosch or, um, you know, one of the rural parts of, of uh, the Winelands. Um, but you can see the, the homestead was quite grand, very elaborate gables. Um, the outbuildings consisted of slave quarters, um, a wine cellar, um, and stables, uh, that sort of thing. 
And just in the foreground, it's a little bit unclear, but you can see this winding road leading to the homestead. And that was actually the forerunner of Hanover Street. So um, just to give you an idea of how that sort of developed, it really was just a farm track that led to Zonderboom originally, and it became formalized into a, a busy uh, thoroughfare in District 6. Okay, um, now this is what Zonderblom Homestead looks like today. So, you know, people say that everything was destroyed in District 6, but some of the older buildings were actually uh, escaped demolition. Um, obviously, this was on the edge of District 6, on the, on the very um, eastern edge, but um, <clears throat> it was, and because it was church property, um, that probably saved it. It was kind of separate from District 6 itself. Um, but it was bought by um, the church in um, the 1860s for the uh, establishment of the Zonneblum College, uh, where they uh, educated um, sons of Kosa chiefs at first, and then uh, brought in girls as well. And then later, um, it became uh, a sort of colored school predominantly. Um, and so the, the buildings were adapted for the purpose, but they didn't really change too much, um, except for, I mean, if you look at the homestead here, you can see it's got a, it was changed uh, fairly uh, late in the sort of, well, early in the 20th century. Um, I think it was actually after a fire. Um, so it lost its thatch roof, um, but you can still see that it looks, it has the, all the sort of shape of a, a Cape Dutch building. And it's the last H-shaped, traditional H-shaped Cape Dutch building in the city bowl of Cape Town. So it's quite an important, important homestead. Um, and, um, You'll know of Sophie Gray as well, who designed some beautiful churches um, around the, the Cape, uh, usually stone churches, but um, such as the Belvedere Church in Neisner um, and the beautiful Holy Trinity Church in Caledon. Um, and she designed this little chapel on right next to the Zonneblum homestead. Here's the Zonneblum homestead you're looking from the, the roof. And the chapel was actually a, a supposedly a, an adaptation of the old wine cellar. So it went from wine to wine to, um, to a very sort of strict uh, um, religious type of building. But, um, and it's quite simple, but it's um, the sort of Gothic style um, arches are quite, were quite popular at the time. And uh, it's quite unusual that it, you know, that um, a female architect was was producing these interesting buildings um, at, you know, at such an early period of of Cape history. Um, she was quite a forerunner, um, so yeah, she should be really remembered for her contribution to Cape architecture. Um, sorry, that was a picture of her at the bottom left. Okay, so this is a part of a, a very beautiful panorama. Some of you will know it, um, the Josephus uh, Jones panorama. He was a German um, soldier who was stationed at the Cape for quite a short time, I think. But he did some really, really beautiful artworks and, and maps um, of various parts of the Cape, um, especially Cape Town. And um, you can, you'll recognize he did this, it was a very huge panorama actually, um, but you can see, you can recognize Devil's Peak and just notice how beautifully detailed and accurate it is. Um, so his accuracy can be quite well trusted for the way he rendered um, early buildings of Cape Town. Um, if you look, where I'm circling now, uh, you'll see a white-walled um, enclosure, which is an old, one of those old market garden estates. 
and just hidden behind the trees is a, a flat roofed house. Um, that became known as Velkeliachen, not to be confused with the Velkeliachen in Mowbray where Mustard's Mill um, was standing until recently before it went down. Um, this one is on at the base, was at the base of Devil's Peak, um, very close to the castle. You can actually see the castle, the edge of the castle here, one of the um, uh, battlements, and uh, the sort of slopes of Devil's Peak here. And so this was another early property in um, what became District 6. Um, Zonneblom was sort of up to the left, higher on the hill, and this occupied much of the land um, behind the castle. And then here, you can just see the edge of the Grand Parade, just to give you an idea of the position. Um, and then um, there were some other little estates, which I'll also mention to the right of it. Um, and this was owned by Jan Willem Werner, who uh, anybody who's done research on old properties will know, will be familiar with his name because he did beautiful, he was a surveyor, and I think he trained under Thibaut, so he, he had a beautiful, um, he rendered beautiful survey diagrams, um, they're just really little works of art, and very accurate and beautifully done um, in colour and um, uh, just with amazing detail. So when you go to the archives and you, you um, research old properties, you'll see in those old title deed documents, some of his, his um, works still, still in there. And they're, they're beautiful, I love them. So he owned Valkeliachen um, and then gradually that was absorbed by the sort of old fabric of District 6. So, um, like many of the other old homesteads, um, Valkeliachen, like I say, was absorbed into the more modern fabric of District 6. So towards the end of the 19th century, when there was a lot more development going on in District 6, um, slaves had been emancipated uh, in the 1830s, um, and then they, they needed places to stay, cheap places to stay. There were a lot of immigrants um, coming from Europe. Um, many of them were very working class. Um, some of them were used as laborers. So there was a lot of there were a lot of uh, people coming to Cape Town, and they needed places to stay. So it started getting intensively developed on the old farmlands. And Valkeliachen um, remained standing. You can see it here in rather poor shape. It was a very long building. This is in the 19, early 1960s, I think. Um, and um, this beautiful complex called Vernon Terrace was built around it, early, uh, late 19th century. Um, and it was built by wealthy Jewish, uh, a, a Jewish community um, for, for Jewish occupants. And then gradually they moved out as it became more and more um, sort of crowded and they started letting these houses to, um, to mainly colored residents. And that, that's who was living there as, at, at its end when the whole area was demolished. Um, but Valkeliachen stayed standing. It was converted into a, a number of flats. Um, you can see it's a very long building. So they had lots of little rooms. Um, <clears throat> and uh, eventually round about when when uh, District 6 was um, declared a white group area, it was the whole of Vernon Terrace was demolished um, despite efforts to try and save it by various heritage groups, including Hans Franzen. He tried to um, ensure that it was saved, but to no avail. Um, <clears throat> and that's, that's a picture of it being demolished, of Valkeliachen being demolished. So, um, this is an 18th century building. It had been modernized, but just that there was no respect for, let alone, you know, there was no respect for the people being moved out and there was no respect for the architecture either. Um, and I think this picture really is a, uh, an illustration of the sort of uh, very um, drastic clearing of of um, amazing architecture and 
an amazing, a very vibrant neighborhood. I think this illustrates it very well, um, just the sort of destruction that, that really happened. Um, in the background, you can see Blue Morph Flats, which were built on another old estate, Blue Morph, and took its name. And they are still standing today, but now they're called Skyways Flats. Um, so now fast forwarding to uh, more modern times, so the early 2000s, um, the C CPUT, um, Cape Peninsula University of Technology, as you know, has occupied much of um, parts of District 6 and <clears throat> since its demolition. Um, and they wanted to build a, a residence for their students um, further down towards on the edge of Caledon Street. This is Caledon Street here um, on the District 6 side, not on the, on the um, town side of Caledon Street. And this is quite close to the old Fugard Theatre. Um, so this is actually the site of Vernon Terrace and Belchelechen. Uh, it had been undeveloped since it, the whole area was demolished. So it lay vacant for quite a few decades. Um, but when they wanted to build this, this new um, residence, they were instructed by heritage practitioners who worked on the project, who researched the, the site, that they must incorporate um, some of the old materials from, that were found on the site, and they must acknowledge what had happened on the site before. So this was quite a successful project. Um, you'll see um, these bits of stonework on the right, and on the left, it's not that easy to see, but um, those bits of stonework were actually bits of the old uh, homestead that had survived um, under the ground. So it was the, mainly the foundations, beautiful, beautifully built foundations. Um, and these were discovered when they started building operations for this um, residence. And then they were reused on the new building. And also while um, the new building works were happening, they found huge amounts of old pottery and coins and uh, wine bottles and things that were associated with the Valkelechen bath and also some of the, the later buildings of uh, Vernon Terrace. So there's a real mix of stuff that they found. Um, you can see some sort of 20th century coins, um, some 19th century beautiful blue and white um, dinnerware, uh, gaming pieces, um, shells that they used for gaming pieces, a street number for probably one of the Vernon Terrace houses. And the archaeologists were most excited about this little cooking pot um, because it was the earliest object that they found, uh, probably 1760s roughly, um, which dated the site to quite an early period of, of development in District 6. Um, so they could kind of deduct from that that the Valkelechen homestead uh, was already standing um, in the 1760s, but uh, just probably a very basic three-roomed homestead with that gradually grew bigger and bigger. Okay, another early um, uh, little market garden. Um, for those of you who know District 6, you probably know of De Villiers Street, which goes off um, Ruland Street. And that got its name from the De Villiers family who actually had a this market garden estate. Um, it was called Verkus List. And you can see where my mouse is now. It's another part of that Josephus Jones panorama, very accurate. Um, so sort of 1808. And you'll see um, where I'm dragging my mouse, that became De Villiers Street. And where I'm dragging it up there, that was Ruland Street, which didn't really exist at the top of the road. It was just a uh, mountainside, really. There were proteas growing here and everything. And then gradually, Ruland Street stretched further up and then became Deval Drive up there. Um, and then here's Constitution Street. 
and um, that's the white wall of Berkus List and the homestead in the middle. Um, so again, a, another flat roofed house. There weren't many um, thatched Cape Dutch uh, style um, houses in districts, early district six, except for Zona Blum. Uh, there was only one other that I actually found in my research, which I, uh, you'll, you'll see in the book, uh, Valcom. Um, but otherwise the rest were um, quite simple, uh, flat roofed houses. Sometimes they had beautiful, uh, Sort of Cape Dutch um, sash windows and things, and uh, pillars on either side of the door, and, and nice architectural detail. But they weren't the typical um, thatched houses that you got it on the other edges of the city bowl. Um, and then um, 1859, uh, the first. Um, sort of panorama of photographic panorama of Cape Town was done by uh, William Millard, Mortimer Millard, and a uh, photographer. And he um, captured part of um, the upper end of District 6, as it was. And uh, you can see this is the same estate. It's a different angle, but it's the same estate of Berkus List. And you can see this long um, opstall. It looks blank in the middle, but that's just trees that were actually covering the house and in these um, outbuildings on either edge of the house. And there's a big grand entrance in the middle. So these weren't um, small, uh, poor houses. These were large, uh, grand homesteads um, owned by wealthy farmers. I mean, they weren't, they weren't, um, you know, they weren't struggling they were actually quite wealthy people um, even though they had gradually that more and more people started settling around this area in in poorer rental housing um, these people were still quite wealthy people um, behind the actual homestead there were lines of vineyards so they produced wine and, and table grapes um, which is something that's never really been mentioned much about um, early, uh, the early Table Valley, as they call it, or the City Bowl, was that there was quite a lot of wine production, um, which sort of died out when the um, phylloxera um, parasite came into the vineyards in the late 19th century, it destroyed a lot of vineyards. Um, but until then, there was quite a lot of uh, grape growing in, in the City Bowl. And then this picture I took from Signal Hill in 2017. It's the same area again. You can see how built up it is now. Um, there's uh, the E News building that was built quite recently there. And right in the middle, there are actually some remains of the old Verkus List Opstal, um, which is quite amazing considering that the original homestead was built in 1797 um, and then extended uh, gradually. Um, so people don't really know that in the middle of these modern buildings is a, is a very old uh, remains, altered remains of, a, of this old homestead. Um, it's endangered at the moment because there's a lot of development going on in this area. And because it's been altered quite badly, um, people, it will probably get demolished. I don't, I don't see it being saved unless a very sensitive, uh, development is done where they can actually save the building. Okay, so the centre, the main homestead of Valkus List was called uh, Hill House later, an English name. Um, was a, like the other homesteads of District 6, early homesteads, it was also flat roofed. Uh, <clears throat> there were many flat roofed houses in the top of gardens in Cape Town. Um, and uh, mainly because of the fire hazard, thatched roofs, if you built too close to the mountain, was a big fire hazard. Um, and also at one point, um, there was, they cracked down on actually allowing, allowing new thatched buildings to be built. They had, you had to build with a flat roof because of the fire hazard. Um, so when this photo was taken, the Mills family were living, living 
in Hill, Hill House. Um, they were a wealthy milling family. Um, strangely enough, they were <laughs> called the Mills family and they were in milling. Um, they produced the first anchor yeast and um, they were quite a wealthy, wealthy family of 1820 settler origin. Um, when I did my first talk for, for the book, I showed this picture and you can see um, one of the Mills children standing on the stoop. This was taken in about the early 1900s, um, dressed in his little sailor outfit. And there was an elderly lady in the audience and she said, I recognize that photograph and that's my father. So that was quite amazing to, um, to get a, a direct connection with uh, one of the Mills descendants um, who actually recognized her family member um, on the stoop of this house that's um, since been mostly demolished. And I also published in the book a picture of this little cabinet, which was in another Mills family um, homestead, which was right opposite Verkus List, called Blumhof. I mentioned that earlier, where Blumhof flats are now standing. And uh, it was quite a grand homestead, much like Leonhof. Um, and it had a lot of beautiful china. And like I said, they were a wealthy family. So different family members owned different homesteads right next to each other in District 6. And um, this cabinet was full of old uh, china, apparently from a shipwreck in Table Bay that, that had been salvaged. And then one of the Mills family members bought these old bits of um, old plates and things. Um, and this stood in the homestead. It was, had pride of place in the Blumhof homestead. And I was quite captivated by this picture because I thought, well, what happened to all these bits and pieces in the cabinet when the Blumhof homestead was demolished for the building of the Blumhof flats? And the um, descendant of the boy in the photograph actually told me that they still had the, the cabinet and she invited me to her sister's house. It was in her 90s. And there was a cabinet sitting in her flat in Rondebosch. So I was quite amazed that this cabinet had moved around um, for almost 100 years um, and was still there. Unfortunately, all the little treasures in it were gone. So they might have been sold or um, given to other family members. Nobody seemed to know what happened to them, but the cabinet's still there in Rondebosch. Um, here's just a picture of, I told you that the Mills family were uh, a, milling, a milling family. So Daniel Mills and Sons was the name of the, the company, started by Daniel Mills on the left. Um, he came out with his family as, as his parents, uh, as an 1820 settler. And um, he started this very successful milling business. Um, so I just pointed out some of the uh, landmarks that you can see in this photograph. This is his mill that he had built for Daniel Mills and Sons, where they produced the anchor yeast, the first anchor yeast. Um, if you look very carefully at this entrance here, there's a little uh, um, anchor picture, and that was the Anchor Yeast logo. And this is Darling Street running along here. And um, just above the rooftops is the upper edges of District 6. And that's De Villiers Street running there. And that's Verkus List Hill House. Um, and that whole little enclave of Mills family um, homesteads. So they were quite, like I said, they were a wealthy family who owned quite a large bit of property at the very upper edges of District 6 on the edge of Roland Street. So it wasn't all poor people living in District 6, although they had a lot of poor people living just outside the gates. It was quite a mixed community of wealthy people and poorer people and working class um, all coexisting. Um, but then sort of by the early 20th century, a lot of the wealthy people were moving out. It was too crowded for them. 
and um, then more and more uh, subdivisions occurred and it became even more crowded. Um, I just sort of I'd show you on the right hand side is a picture of Harrington House, um, named after Thomas Talbot Harrington, who was uh, also an immigrant. He'd come from, um, made his money and his fortune in India and um, came to the Cape. Uh, he was a merchant and, uh, and he actually imported all the materials to build his house on, on a ship. From the UK and uh, he built this what became a timber store later but it was one of the finest houses in Cape Town at the time. It was a talking point because it had all been every single um, brick had been and window had been imported from on, on the ship. Very expensive thing to do and um, the, the building style was very different to the Cape Dutch style which was built in the 1830s so the Cape Dutch style was no longer popular becoming very anglicized, everything, everything was very English style, Georgian, and um, Harrington House really was uh, a brand new style of building for Cape Town. Uh, by the time this picture was taken though, to come down in the world, it was becoming very industrialized in Darling Street. And so, um, yeah, like I said, it been turned into a wood store. Um, but Harrington Street was named after this house and Thomas Talbot Harrington. Um, it was spelled with one R, H-A-R-I-N-G-T-O-N, uh, but then it just became Harrington, Harrington Street. So that's how Harrington Street got its name. Uh, back to Verkus List. Um, it, the remains of the homestead, uh, it's one of the sort of side wings got incorporated into the Shack nightclub in De Villiers Street. Um, I remember going there as a student. It used to be a very popular student place. And I remember, because I'd always been interested in old Cape buildings, I remember going into the bar and seeing this amazing stone wall and thinking this building must be very old. Um, so that's one of the things that started inspiring me to do the research for this book, because I wanted to find out why has this bar got this amazing old stone walls and um, you can see these painted beams? Must be an old building, even though the front of it looks very, very modernized. Um, and that it sort of started fueling the, the idea for this book. Um, so as I say, this building is threatened. Um, the Shack nightclub is mostly closed now and developers are knocking on the door all the time, wanting to buy the property to develop it. Um, recently at the top of Ruland Street, uh, just behind the old Verkus List um, homestead site, they uh, did some building work to build a, um, a storage unit um, development and when they were doing the development, they found a lot of old bits of pottery, porcelain, um, and um, it was the uh, site of a study that um, uh, Dr. Ute Siermann, a German um, archeologist, did some research on the site and she found all these bits. Um, it was probably used as a dumping site for old uh, kitchen refuse and things. They didn't have dustbins and things to, to take um, stuff away. They just threw it in a pile in a, on a dump. Um, so, and it could also have been associated with the Bacchus List um, homestead. Um, it's mainly 19th century stuff, but there was a lot of it. They found a lot. And all over District 6, you'll find bits of pottery and things. There's a lot of um, for those of you who are interested in archaeology, there's a lot of archaeology that's still there to be found. I mean, a lot of stuff lying on the surface, um, interesting stuff. So the bulldozers didn't actually de de destroy everything. They actually really, there's a lot of stuff lying under the surface. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that um, the old estates started getting carved up in the 19th century after the end of slavery. And 
this picture is a very good illustration of some of the early buildings um, that were built on those estates after they started getting carved up for housing. Um, here's typical sort of flat roofed, it's almost like a, a Burkhardt style house. Um, still also in that Burkhardt style with the sash windows and nice little architectural detailing. You know, there was pride taken in the building of these houses. Um, that's a good illustration of some of the early um, buildings that were built in District 6. This was done in the 1830s by Sir Charles de Oily. Um, he was a great artist um, who was living at the Cape for a few years and uh, he always depicted himself in the artworks. So you can see him there on his horseback and uh, there's always a dog barking at, at someone. So there's the dog barking at the soldiers. Um, you can see some slaves or freed slaves sitting here, um, barefoot usually, and um, yeah, a hawker with his um, wagon. So it's a real, it's a great illustration of the sort of real mix of people um, in the area at the time. The sort of grand gentleman in his top hat, the slaves, the soldiers, um, you know, so it's quite a mix of typical cosmopolitan mix of people. Okay, this is also an early photograph um, showing how um, the edges of District 6 had sort of expanded and, and really been developed. Um, so here you can, we're looking from Signal Hill now. And here you can see the Grand Parade. There's the castle, there's Table Bay, and it was still quite close to the castle. And this is Batenkant Street. And then <clears throat> this whole white mass is all District 6 early buildings. Um, so to be, become very built up by the 1860s and towards 1900, even more so, it was really, really getting uh, very overcrowded and uh, a lot of developers were, were taking advantage of, of having this open land and buying up huge parcels of land, <coughs> excuse me, and developing it for cheap rental housing. Um, in the background, you can see the um, terraces, vine terraces of um, Zonneblum, because uh, <clears throat> they still kept, even though it was the, the Zonneblum College, they still kept producing farm produce on the estate for the actual college. So well into the late, 19th century, it was still producing <clears throat> um, vines, grapes and things and uh, vegetables. <clears throat> um, and another homestead that survived the demolitions of District 6, right next to the Moravian Chapel on Moravian Hill in District 6, above what used to be Hanover Street, was uh, a sort of 18 circa 1850 little homestead um, that was actually built before the chapel was built <clears throat> and uh, yeah it's a typical sort of um, Cape Georgian building with this little fan light and double doors and then a later Victorian um, veranda was added which was quite attractive actually. Um, so this wasn't demolished either when when uh, District 6 was demolished. It was one of the few survivors. So as such, it's also one of the early, earliest remaining buildings left of District 6. Most people don't even know that it's there. So if you take a drive up next to CPUT towards the mountain, um, you'll see on the left-hand side, there's a lot of new land claimant building, District 6. Uh, um, development for land claimants, housing development, and um, you'll see this house is still standing there. Okay, um, <clears throat> I mentioned Hanover Street earlier. So Hanover Street was one of the main thoroughfares going through District 6, and by the 20th century it was very busy, 
had a lot of shops, um, <clears throat> had a lot of uh, street trading with fruit and vegetables and uh, beautiful fabrics, things like that. Um, this is Hanover Street running here. And um, this building, the Hanover Buildings, was one of the sort of landmarks of District 6 and Hanover Street. Um, so I included this picture to show how this little farm track that had originally um, led to the Zonnebloom homestead was now this bustling inner city um, uh, part of a suburb. And uh, people living above their shops, um, quite beautiful architecture. And even though it was a little bit run down, it was, the architecture was really uh, attractive, um, which just adds to the sort of tragedy of, um, you know, the human tragedy is obviously the, the biggest thing, but also the architectural tragedy of demolishing all these beautiful buildings, which really didn't need to be demolished. Um, this photograph was taken in the, I think in the 1960s or 70s, and you can see um, the removal trucks moving people out. So it is already on its last, last days when um, people being forced out and uh, soon these buildings would be demolished. Um, so Hanover Street, as you'll know, was recently um, renamed it was it was reinstated in Cape Town um, but what's now called Hanover Street isn't actually the original Hanover, Hanover Street um, it's actually what used to be called Kaiserskracht Street which was an extension of Darling Street um, which is actually this bit here running along here um, there is actually a bit of Hanover Street in the foreground here it's still actually there even though all the houses were demolished um, I did some research when I was doing the, the book and I, I wanted to find out exactly where Hanover Street had, had been because the modern street grid in District 6 is actually very different from the original District 6 street layout. Um, a lot of the routes have changed and um, even what's, even some of the old street names that were, you'll recognize from District District 6, like Aspelung Street, um, are actually on a different course now. They're not actually the same roads, so it's quite confusing. So I got an old map and I imposed it, superimposed it on a modern map. And then I found that this is actually part of Hanover Street. So really this, this bit of tar should really have, have some sort of um, monument there to say this is actually part of the original Hanover Street because it'll get demolished, it'll get um, redeveloped. And really, I think it should, somebody should mark it as some sort of monument because it was such a, an important street for Cape Town and District 6. Okay, so by the early 1980s, the clearance of District 6 actually took a long time. Um, so around about 1966, they started demolishing houses and it, the process was still happening in the early 1980s, although most of it had been done by then. So I can rem vaguely remember as a child um, driving with my parents along Duval Drive here and seeing bulldozers just at the upper edges um, demolishing the last bits of District 6. Um, so it took, you know, a long time to actually demolish this huge part of Cape Town. Um, and when you think the amount of money and resources that it took to do that, it just seems really, really crazy. Like um, a huge waste of resources and, and causing so much um, hardship for people. And it really um, could have been could have been uh, redeveloped in a in a more sensitive way and and not wasting all that money and time. And um, it just seems crazy now especially when we need housing for so many people. Anyway, um, here's a picture on the left of looking behind the castle again, taken in the 1920s, showing how built up um, District 6 was at that point. And looking at a similar view here in the early 1980s when the whole area had been 
um, demolished, except for a few uh, churches and mosques. That's pretty much all they left. And one or two, like I say, Zonneblum survived and one or two other buildings, but not much. Okay, so a lot of people ask um, how many people have moved back to District 6 that are land claimants. So I did some research. Um, you can see these are, this is a new complex of houses being built in District 6 for land claimants. It's been a very, very slow process. So of those 60,000 people that were forcibly removed um, between 1966 and 1983, 2,760 land claims were lodged in 1998 as part of the land claims process. 1,449 people opted for financial compensation, so they didn't get land, they just got a, a cash payout. 1,201 chose to return to District 6, so they wanted to move back. And um, by mid-2018, so some almost 50 years later, 139 claimants had received housing there. So, I mean, it's a tiny, tiny amount of people. Um, but now recently, you would have heard in the news, um, there's been a lot of uh, news coverage about um, people trying to sort out the, the land claims process. And there are now uh, 108 new claimant housing units that are set to be moved into in June, July this year. So um, this month, actually. Um, so we'll see if that happens. Um, but they will be moving into this um, complex that is now being finished. Um, to give you an idea of where it is, it's next to CPUT. And um, this little um, open area here is the old course of Hanover Street. So it's quite nice that it's being built along the old course of Hanover, Hanover Street. That in a way, Hanover Street is rising again from the ashes. Um, so recently, with the big fire of Cape Town that destroyed Mustard's Mill and many other historical buildings, um, I was very worried about, because I live in Woodstock, I was very worried about the Zonneblum homestead because it's one of the last remaining buildings of District 6 and uh, it's of 18th century origin. So it's one of the oldest houses uh, left on the eastern part of Cape Town. Um, and the fire, when the fire jumped the highway, I was very concerned because I, the wind was absolutely pumping that day. And uh, I just saw how quickly it spread. And um, I was very worried about the homestead burning down, even though it doesn't have a thatched roof anymore, um, it can still burn down. And you'll see how close, this is one of the sports fields of the school at Zonoblum, right behind the house, and that was completely burnt. So it got very, very close to the house. Luckily, um, it was put out just before it actually got to the house. So can, we almost came very close to losing another um, historical homestead. Okay, well, thank you for listening. Um, this, I'd just like to say the book is dedicated to the 60,000 people who lost their homes in District 6, and I uh, really did it as much for myself, but also for them. Uh, I think uh, it's nice, I think it'd be nice for um, people of the future to also read this history of District 6 and find out how it became what it, what, what it became and how it actually developed from these early uh, farming estates. Um, so if you, if you get the book, you'll see a lot of detail about these early estates and some of the early people and also some of the early streets of District 6 that I touched on in the talk.